so in this episode I thought I would talk a little bit again about technique so these are notes on technique for Vipassana meditation because I sense that there is a degree of confusion and there are certain things just to bear in mind and I think it's just helpful to go through some of those so yeah so I'll just talk for a few minutes on technique um, so I think one of the one of the first things I wanted to say was I know that when we think of meditation when we think of spiritual uh, matters we can create ideas in our minds about what we would like it to be we have presumptions about we hear about we read about people having extraordinary experiences and we want extraordinary experiences to take us out of our humdrum existence we want we want something special to happen to us we want to be special we want to be perceived as special either perceived by other people as being special or seeing ourselves as being special as having a, a special and important role in life uh, so all in all this can lead lead us down a, a, a track where we assume meditation is about having extraordinary experiences and it's unquestionably the case that if you go down the Samatha path that's the path of tranquility meditation of becoming one pointed to such a degree that you lose awareness of your physical uh, existence that you go into extraordinary extraordinary truly extraordinary experiences um, people that have done hallucination hallucinatory drugs and the like in the past will have this kind of um, default where they believe that somehow meditation is a replication of that so what people are chasing are, are experiences those experiences do exist you can have those experiences they are transient however um, and so when it comes to hearing about vipassana meditation and I will especially talk about how we're looking at the components of our ordinary experience and we're not looking for deep mystical experiences although we'll come on to fruitions in a future video but the whole purpose of Vipassana meditation is to look at the full range of human experience and see what those experiences are actually made of to actually comprehend apprehend and comprehend the building blocks the fundamental building blocks the aggregates that go to make up each and every experience and see how transient unsatisfactory and selfless all those um, components actually are so we're just looking at our ordinary experience our ordinary humdrum lives what happens as a consequence of doing that is is that you lose all your presumptions because in 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 the process of becoming which is very central to the whole buddhist teaching how we are out of a sense of ignorance we are always in a state of becoming where we always think life lies over the next ridge the next dune the next mountain the other side of that that will be my happiness that will be my fulfillment so we're on this perpetual treadmill this wheel of becoming and because of that we're never actually looking at what's right in front of us what's right under our noses and at the more you get the technique of what person are right and the more you're practicing correctly the less you make that presumption and the less you overlook the moment and you start to see begin to see and recognize the true wonder that existence actually is so that sense of it being humdrum being ordinary is part of the res 
part of the result of ignoring life and misinterpreting life. It is extraordinary that any of this, anything at all, is occurring. So that's one really important point that that people feel become jaded or, or feel like, well, what's the point of just looking at my ordinary experience? I wanted meditation to be more than this. And that really brings us on to balancing our effort, what right effort is. Because if you get the balance right, you will have this incredible sense of fascination. It's, a, it's an aspect of PT, of, of pleasurable interest, that the mind settles down beautifully in Vipassana because it's got the balance right and it is just looking at what's actually taking place. So to explain that a little bit, we are just looking at the ordinary component, the, the, the fundamental components of our ordinary experience, and we are all intimately familiar with what we mean by that. The aggregates are, you are very familiar with the aggregates. It's just looking at experience in a slightly new way. So I, I've, uh, there's a link to a PDF with the aggregates um, in the section below, so you can click on that link and download the PDF. But when we talk about aggregates, we are talking about things like shape and color, sounds, tastes, smells, tactile sensations, thoughts, perceptions, feelings, volitional tendencies like um, craving, resistance, envy, anger, joy, pleasurable interest, tranquility, concentration. We are all actually entirely familiar with all of this, but we haven't really looked at it. So when we meditate, the idea, the point at which we're properly practicing Vipassana meditation, is that point where we are not trying to control anything. We're not trying to manipulate some experience into being. We're not trying to get concentrated. We're not trying to get calm. But we're not ignoring anything. And so the mindset is one of inclusivity, genuine inclusivity, where we're not rejecting any aspect of our experience. And the hindrances, the things that get in the way of that, are the times when we are trying to manipulate, trying to control, trying to change things, trying to stop something from arising or trying to force something to end, where we're trying, forever trying to create in real time that image of ourselves in meditation, that little lie we tell ourselves about what we think meditation is all about. And when we get the balance right, we're doing none of that at all. We're not trying to conform to a pattern. We're not trying to get things right. At the moment, where I am, it's raining for the umpth, umpteenth time in a row, day in a row. And there's the pitter-patter of the rain. And so it's just being there with that sound of the pitter-patter of the rain. You know that. You know what that is. How skillful do you have to be in order to just take full account of that and just be with that? You're not concentrated. You're not in a deeply concentrated or otherwise mystical state of mind. It's just, you're just being with that experience and the pitter-patter of the rain. There are just these fleeting moments of sound. There's the sensitive matter of the physical ear, which has to be there. And there's hearing arises. And the hearing is arising because the conditions allow it. And each moment of hearing arises and passes away. And there's the perception that, yeah, it's the pitter-patter of the rain. So that's a perception. And for me, that's quite a 
So rising is quite a pleasant experience. So I note the pleasure. It's the feeling. And there's the acknowledgement that there is investigation going on. There is the investigating of the sound. See, I'm not trying to get anywhere, am I? I'm not trying to produce anything. I'm just taking account of what is actually unfolding in my experience at this moment. And as you do that, because you're not fighting with anything, you're not trying to force anything into being, you're not denying anything. See, so if another sound intervenes, I don't know, like a car backfires down the road, got a busy road outside here, or there's an ambulance roars up the hill or whatever, if you've got the balance right and you're being inclusive, then the mind just attends to that experience. And it isn't there isn't anything out of place, there isn't anything wrong. Oh, okay, there's another sound. Another perception arising based on the, the contact of the the sound, the ear base, and the uh, hearing consciousness. Those three things coming together, this perception arises. Oh, it's ambulance. And so everything is simple, extremely simple. But you're alert, you're awake. One thing I suggest to people on a Wednesday night when they come to one of our meetings is that you came in your car, you didn't fall asleep at the wheel of your car. Why? because you knew that you had to take proper account of your environment in order to drive the car safely to your destination. So when we meditate, it has to be like we're driving a car in that sense, that we apply the same degree of willing, the, the willing to be alert and to, to be together and to be here now and not to just give up to the tendency of the mind say, well, there isn't anything going wrong, so I'll just I'll just slip into a reverie and just drift off into uh, into la la land. No, you have to take responsibility. So one so one aspect of the technique is to set the practice up properly by reminding yourself of what that balance is. So it's alert, it's attentive, but it's non egotistical. It's not trying to accomplish anything. It's not trying to get anywhere but it is alert so it's taking full responsibility for the moment full responsibility to attending to the moment observing what's actually taking place and that balance when you get it fascination naturally emerges but the hindrances are you can't just see something once and say oh I've understood that now I won't be bothered by that now. When we meditate, we have to be inclusive of hindrances, so inclusive of, of mental states like boredom, frustration, impatience, anxiety, self-hatred. You have to include those as part of the practice. So, by including them, let's focus on boredom, say, because Obviously, we're being asked to look at just our ordinary experience. Where, what's the fun in that? We feel like, oh, this is a chore. Why do I have to do this? So you set the practice up by reflecting on Buddha's teaching and why you follow the way and what practicing with Pasana will give you in terms of eliminating, eradicating the causes of suffering. So you get a degree of um, inspiration to practice and then you start practicing and you just sit and you say okay well what's going on in my experience? So you note your bodily disposition, your, whether there are any aches and pains, what, what, what state the body is in, it's neither right nor wrong, so there's a pain here, there's an ache there, there's a Maybe the 
the body feels relaxed. You just accept whatever it is that you find. Okay, what state's the mind in? Well, the mind is even, or I'm in a mood, or whatever it happens to be. You just accept, you just, that's what's arising, so that's what you acknowledge. And then you become aware of the pitter patter of the rain, and you acknowledge all the elements that are going on there. But after a little while, you say, God, how long has gone on? How long has this been going on? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Are we near the end yet? So it's at that point, that's where the skill in the practice comes from. And it's simply the skill of including the arising of boredom in this instance. It's your willingness to note boredom, to include it as uh, that which is unfolding in this moment, because that's, that's the truth. And by properly noting the hindrance, in this case the boredom, you can look at it. And there is the mindfulness and the clear comprehension that this in, indeed is the quality of boredom. And that brings a completely different relationship. A completely different relationship. So, okay, well, boredom is what is unfolding in my experience now. I'm not going to fight it. That's, that's it. But you're no longer in it. You're observing it as it were, as a, a, a mental formation arising in that moment. It's included in the aggregate of mental formations. And you find that it's very easy to let go of that sense of boredom because you're not fighting it. You're not immersed in it. You've labelled it clearly. So labelling, noting, in one of, it, one of its aspects is that it brings clarity. So the more familiar you become with boredom, and this is the great paradox, the less bored you are. The more you see boredom and note it, the less bored you are. And as a consequence, the fascination arises. And so we can go back to that original point I was making, saying, yeah, it is your ordinary, it is the components of your ordinary experience, but the components of your ordinary experience are not ordinary. It's fascinating, deeply fascinating. And, and the more you start to, to recognise the characteristics of whatever it is that you're labelling, i.e. that the boredom is transient and it's arisen due to conditions, then it becomes a, even more fascinating. So, yeah, so I thought that was important to talk about, really. Now, some people are taught early on to focus on the breathing as a way of overcoming hindrances. And that's absolutely correct, that's right. But I think people put too much emphasis on watching the breath and counting breaths. And they make a whole problem out of counting breaths. And it's not about counting breaths at all. It's about noting and observing the true nature of your experience. When someone practices samatha meditation, tranquility meditation, then their whole uh, emphasis is on observing the breath to the exclusion of everything else. However, to do that, you still have to take proper mindful account of the, 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 things that, the other things that the, the mind becomes interested in. And what happens is, as your mindfulness and your concentration grow stronger, your ability to, to take account of what else arises and then dismiss it allows you to remain focused on the breath. So it's like, it's like that. And you just end up just, just solidly there on, on, on the breath, the exclusion of everything else. But that's samatha practice. That's taking you into the jhanas, the fixed meditations. That's not what vipassana is about. So there has to be, as part of your the way that you you set a practice up, there has to be an acknowledgement that it's not about counting breaths. Counting breaths is a tool that you can employ in certain situations. But that's not what you're sitting down to do. What you're sitting down to do 
is to mindfully explore the components of your ordinary experience. And so really, the emphasis should be on that. Then using the breath as your reference point for when you get lost in thoughts, you know where to come back to. And the coming back to the breath can also uh, be employed as a, the reminder for what your purpose actually is. So that means that you can be so much more relaxed when you meditate. You want to be alert, you want to be awake. You, your posture wants to reflect the desire to be alert and awake. But then you're relaxed, you're not trying to get anywhere else, you're not preventing anything from arising. You're allowing for the fact that thoughts will arise. You note the thoughts and bring the attention back front and centre. So if that's the breathing process, and we teach observing the breathing process at the abdomen, that's your reference point, that's your anchor. But it's a very light observation, which is not trying to stop other things from occurring. It's fine, it's fine for the mind to become interested in what you did yesterday. Because when you become aware that you've got involved with those thoughts, your mindfulness is re-established. You can then label that as memory, with a pleasant feeling maybe, and then bring the attention back front and centre. I quite like that actually, front and centre rather than back to the breath. It is the breath that we look at, but what we're really doing is bringing ourselves back to here and now. So that's the process, and so having that lovely sense of spaciousness having that lovely sense of unhurriedness. You set your alarm for 30 minutes and you're just happy for whatever comes up to come up. And you know that mindfulness and concentration are mental factors that can be developed and made strong over time. And so you, you are not at all phased when thinking picks up and takes us on a little journey because once you become aware that that's happened you have just strengthened your mindfulness you've just strengthened your ability to note and to be clearly comprehending of what's unfolding in your experience it's a success yet so many people go oh i've gone wrong i've gone wrong oh no oh. and it's just not the case so Just at that point, you bring it back to the reference point of the breath and a very light observation of the breathing process, letting it just be what it is. If it is that the mind becomes fascinated with the breathing process, you can just leave it there and you can just observe the transient, natures, transient nature of the ebb and flow of the, the breath and of the various muscles pushing and pulling and so forth. That's, you can learn a lot, lot from that. But it's not exclusive. It's not about being exclusively on the breath. Um, I remember when I discovered where that balance was in my practice. That was such a delightful moment. It was like game on. It's like, oh, do you know what I mean? I'm not going to watch the breath. <laughs> because that really is mindfulness of breathing, whereas Vipassana is mindfulness of the aggregates, essentially. Mindfulness of trans the transient nature of the aggregates. And so I learned that I could just sit, I was present. I mean, I've done enough work to, to, to be able to recognize this, but I could just rest in my ordinary mind and allow experiences to come to me, in inverted commas, me, and there would just be the noting of whatever was foremost in attention at, at that time. And I found that that balance uh, could be discovered in walking meditation, in washing up meditation, in getting dressed in the morning meditation, in having a shave meditation, <laughs> in cooking a meal meditation. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? When you find the balance, you realise it's got nothing to do with sitting in a chair, even. All we're doing when we're sitting, sitting down to meditate is, because of 
because of the lack of movement, it means that you can get more focused and you can look more deeply uh, if you've got the right balance. But essentially, all you're really doing when, when you sit to meditate, when you're doing a vipassana, all you're doing is sitting down with your eyes closed. It's no more significant than that. Um, but it is useful because you you will develop your mindfulness and concentration more effectively. But it's not the only, you know, the Buddha taught four postures. And like I say, you, once you know what the balance is, you can apply it anywhere. So, so yes, yeah, so. Wondering what else to say about technique. But the, the real key is to be free of all expectations, to realize that you don't have to have expectations. <coughs> it is an aspect of faith, really. This is where the faith as a, as a spiritual faculty is important. It's having the faith that you can follow the instruction and let everything else take care of itself. And most people don't have enough faith to do that at first. So you have to develop the faith. You have to have the faith that you don't have to have any particular agenda with meditation other than staying alert and allowing experience to arise and just making note of it. And if you, whenever you get that balance, you'll know because it will feel so simple. It'll feel so easy, easeful. You'll feel like you're just operating in the sweet spot, which is just within yourself. You're within yourself. You're not operating at a, an extreme. You're just delightfully within yourself. And your starting position, I'd say, is one of acceptance, not one of, oh, I've got to, I've got to sort my mind out. I've got to sort this out. If, if you're thinking, oh, I've got to sort this out first, you've missed it. There is nothing that you have to sort out. You could not function as a human being without uh, the clarity that you need for Vipassana. So the clarity you need for Vipassana is something which is naturally produced at other times anyway. It's just those times when you're not preoccupied, when you've those times when you've not lost reality because you're in, in your dreams in your head. It's just those times when you are present and you're just and you're learning just to note. And that is delightfully within yourself. And what arises is pleasurable interest or fascination with whatever it is that's unfolding. So those times in life like I don't know, you might be cutting up a bit of fruit or something. And you just become aware of just how amazing all the colours are that you're looking at. It's just that sense of presence, just that sense of wonder. That's what emerges with meditation, with a personal meditation. So, and final point, what will really, really help, and so few people are willing to do this, and I always encourage it in all the workshops I do, I get people to write journal entries after a meditation, you, it will just speed up the process dramatically. It really will. Or if you're doing like walking meditation, it's like stopping regularly just to reflect or retrospect about what took place during that period of mindfulness. And so it's not, it's not about judging your performance. <laughs> It's just, what can I remember about what actually took place during that period of mindfulness? What kind of hindrances were arising? Or if there are no, or equally, were there no hindrances arising? Um, what was I able to note in terms of the aggregates? Oh, there were sounds, I remember there were sounds. Oh, and I remember that sound triggered that memory. Oh, that's good, okay. And you either write it in the journal or you just reflect on it. 
And what that's doing is it's improving your mindfulness because mindfulness is very much allied to memory. So you are actually becoming more mindful of the states occurring. It's improving your ability to discriminate states that are occurring. It gives you a second chance to go through all that information, all that data that was harvested during that period of mindfulness can be used again before it finally vanishes forever. So even though it's in re retrospect, you can still note that all that information, all that data, the sound, the taste, the touch, the thought, the feeling, it's all arisen and now it's all gone without remainder. So it really helps with the comprehension of transience. And so few meditators will do that routinely. It's such a shame because it will lead to such a dramatic development if you're willing just to go that extra mile and keep a journal, meditation journal. So, so yeah, so, but the most important thing is when we meditate is what we're operating from. Our starting position is acceptance that we're not for thinking, oh, I first I have to do something in order to, to then be able to meditate. No, you just sit down and immediately ask yourself, what is actually taking place in my experience right now? And then just move. Allow the flow of conscious experience to unfold and just note what you can as you're going along. You'll be amazed what difference that will make to your practice. Oh, that's 30 minutes. God, I go on, don't I? <laughs> Till the next time.